to pick out three of the <coughs> most, I think, emotionally charged issues during the form program. That's about matching children uh, to adopters, about contact, and you'll understand uh, um, why, as I go through some of the evidence about contact, why the approach on open adoption has been much more cautious in, the, in England here. And then perhaps most emotionally at all, the issue about whether or not uh, we keep siblings together for, for adoption. But let me start with matching. Uh, it, it's extremely time consuming. I gave you some statistics earlier on which showed that even when adopters get through the process of becoming approved, they then have to wait a significant time to be matched. Um, a, a lot of practitioners use complex matrices to try to map out the qualities of adopters against the needs of particular uh, children. Traditionally, the process of matching does not involve adopters at all. The adopters are approved and have had to wait at home until one day, hopefully, a phone call will say, and they'll be told, do you think there might be a child who will be right for you? And uh, this is no longer the case, but certainly in 2011, I've discovered there were not insignificant number of adopters who were approved as adopters uh, who never got a child, they never got a match. Uh, and sometimes adopters in this process have been treated uh, unsympathetically. And one of the things I've discovered is that a lot of people who come forward for adoption in UK are, these, these are very intelligent, articulate people. In any other area of life, they'd be very good consumers. The adoption process turns them into cowed consumers. They are so terrified that by complaining, by asserting their rights, that they won't get a child, that they accept treatment, which uh, has been sometimes uh, not just difficult for them, but to the disadvantage of children. And this has all been helped by, this is a policy statement from the UK government from 2010, just before I started this work, which says making a good match between a child and a prospective adopter is a highly skilled task. And we've had lots of professionals using this complicated matrices approach to try to uh, achieve adoption. The problem is that there's a very, very, well, not a shred of evidence to justify that we can match effectively. This is from uh, Quinton and Selwyn, Julie Selwyn, who have been mentioned a couple of times already. And, uh, the intention of, as, as they say, the intention of, of matching the right child to the right parent can hardly be criticised. But the rhetoric might lead one to presume that we know how to assess needs, how to assess parents who can meet them, and can tell where the needs have been met. Given the effort that goes into matching, it might be thought that there is good evidence that we know how often matching is achieved and that a good match makes a difference. And crucially, such research evidence is lacking, not just sparse, but virtually absent. Now we know quite a lot from uh, in England about the factors which are linked to disruption. Uh, these are the factors uh, uh, which lead to, which have a greater tendency towards disruption for children. Uh, the older the child, the greater the risk of disruption. The number of prior placements and the time spent in placements. Uh, whether the child has been maltreated, particularly whether they've been sexually abused. Uh, whether they're old enough to, to develop a close attachment to the birth family and so forth. Uh, and we know the factors which appear to make would-be adopters much more likely to be successful, warmth, flexibility, crucially a, a flexibility and a willingness to work with the agency to take advice. But, as uh, Professor Rushton says here, no evidence of the possession of any of these characteristics independently predicts a successful placement. Uh, and finally, we know uh, from the limited number of disruptions there are, uh, what some of the factors that might do that. This is where uh, adoptive parents' preferences are stretched, although I'll say something which contradicts that when I come on to say something about uh, adoption parties and adopter-initiated matching. Um, there's a problem where there are co competitive matches. This is where adopters are know that they are being selected with two or three other potential sets of adopters and are effectively competing for the child uh, and that might lead to them uh, suggesting that they have a greater enthusiasm for that particular child than they might have. Placing a child family, a child in a family where there are no adoption support services and placing a child in a family close to the ages of others. I think one of the most significant developments in matching in the last few years 
hugely controversial initially has been the export from uh, the USA and Massachusetts specifically of, uh, we don't call them adoption parties, they're called adoption activity days, but that's essentially they're called, that's what they are, adoption parties. And they're bringing together of adopters and children who are waiting in the same room. Now, some of you may, where, where I think I heard a few uh, signs of description. When this started, I was very, very cautious about them too. I can tell you I followed a party of these very closely. It's been my privilege to attend one of them and spend the whole day there. Uh, and the effect has been dramatically positive. Essentially, bringing adopters and children together recognizes the chemistry which is involved in every relationship in our life. Ask in order to reflect if you have partners or spouses, whether or not any scientific process of matching would have brought you together. Uh, it certainly would never have brought me together with my, my, my wife. There's a chemistry in relationships and allowing adopters to initiate matches recognizes some of that chemistry. Now I hasten to say, adopters don't go to an adoption party and say, I like this child, and then it goes through. The process of assuring that the match is appropriate continues, but the effects have been dramatic. I sat and watched, I was in Nottingham uh, one Saturday uh, last year and watched uh, uh, this incredible event where children are very happy there. Uh, there's all sorts of entertainment for them and clowns and games and things. And interestingly, the children who don't get a match, the research suggests they feel very reassured by the fact that they understand <coughs> There are a lot more children, not just them, waiting for adoption. Uh, but I saw a match taking place. I saw a young lesbian couple meet a child who was not remotely the sort of child they were expected to be adopted. And I saw, I witnessed something happen in that meeting, and I followed it through, and I saw that, that, that adoption took place. It requires adopters to be very open-minded. The social worker who ran the this, this first set of adoption parties had to remind all adopters that they had to go into the room and put aside any prejudices, any thought about the sort of child that would be right for them and just go and meet a lot of children. And something about meeting the child, the real child as opposed to reading the profile has had a dramatic effect. And some children who it was thought were effectively unadoptable, much older children, and specifically older boys, have been adopted through adoption parties. The success of matches through them has been very dramatic. Now, one part of, uh, of matching which is perhaps the most controversial, uh, which I mentioned a couple of times already, is ethnicity and adoption. And it's useful to run through the history here. Actually, in the 60s and 70s, transracial placements began to grow, and the evidence about their success was very clear. But uh, in the 70s, significant resistance developed. And this quote here is given by um, the Association of Black Social Workers to the UK Parliament in 1983. And you can see it's a dramatic step. Transracial placement is, in essence, a microcosm of the oppression of black people in this society. It is, in essence, a form of internal colonization, a new form of slave trade. Uh, and that attitude is not often as strident as expressed to Parliament then, but that has dominated uh, adoption and matching practice through the 70s and 80s. So this organisation, BAF, that I've mentioned a couple of times before, the British Association for Adoption and Fostering, uh, very much uh, have led policy and practice on adoption, have been a great influence on the, on the government. Um, throughout the 80s asserted that the placement of choice for a black child was always a black family and always, always a mixed race child who might have uh, black and white parents was always considered, of course, uh, a black child. Uh, and uh, transracial uh, adoptions almost completely disappeared, despite the fact that once again we had some significant evidence that despite all the Again, well-intended and passionate held belief that these adoptions would be problematic. Despite the research evidence here from Rushton and Dance in 1997, that actually, despite the conviction that uh, these adoptions would break down and the children would experience negative outcomes in terms of their own sense of identity, uh, the evidence suggested 
that that wasn't the case. And transracial adoptions didn't run into any more difficulties than adoptions within the same race. By the year 2000, there was a, in the wake of that research, there was a big grudging shift, but it was still very limited. This again is the British Association for Adoption and Fostering, who said that where black children are placed in white families, this should remain exceptional and be analyzed, justified, and authorized by senior management. Placement within families, within white families, is second best. The Department for Education, the government, uh, sorry, the Department of Health at this time, uh, adoption policies moved from Department of Health to Department for Education in the UK relatively recently. In 2002, uh, there was the first significant move. First of all, a piece of legislation made it mandatory for a local authority to give due consideration to a child's religious persuasion, racial origin, cultural and linguistic background. But the predominant issue was always ethnicity. But at the same time, an overarching requirement for the Act was to reduce delay. And the law there from that point on has required local authorities to relegate the significance of ethnicity or culture if getting a say race match would cause significant delay. But you know, as in so many areas of life, the change in practice which started from this time was due to a bit of serendipity. Paul Boitang, a name very few of you I actually would have heard for, became the UK's first black cabinet minister. He was the Minister of State, a junior minister of the Department of Health. If we had not had a black minister in that job, I don't think this would have happened because there was so much caution on the part of white liberals to dare to suggest that the research evidence should be followed. And Paul Boite played a, a crucial role. But opposition to it has remained uh, profound. When I recommended uh, in my Times report that we should encourage more transracial adoptions because black children were waiting for so much longer than white children for adoption, the British Association of Social Workers and Social Workers Trades Union would say, uh, what they told me, what has been overlooked is the evidence that while some transracial adoptions work, many have had a profoundly negative impact on children's development and identity formation. Uh, and I'm afraid that just is not true. There is no evidence at all support to support that. Passionate though that view might be held, the evidence doesn't support that. Of course, um, it doesn't mean that one could do these things casually. You know, and, and the, there was some practice in the 60s where where a black child, I know, again through a, a, a friend, actually a senior civil servant in the UK who was uh, adopted by white parents and went to live in to a remote village in Scotland where he was the, literally the only black child uh, around. But uh, when transracial adoptions these days in, in England are much more likely to be in urban areas, the children are going to school where there'll be a lot of children uh, with a similar, uh, uh, who are, who are of, uh, who are black or of a mixed race, and parents obviously have to understand uh, that there will be some added complications to the placement. But the evidence, again, from Professor Julie Selwyn uh, is summarized this way. The success of transracial placements is now very clear. Research both in the USA and the UK has consistently revealed the problems of adjustment and self-esteem are no more present in these placements than in other placements. Uh, so the government were persuaded uh, to uh, change the legislation so that, and I hasten to say, it has not dispensed with ethnicity as a factor. In the USA, ethnicity has been dispensed with as a factor. Bill Clinton introduced the 1994 Multi Ethnic Placement Act. So frustrated was he at the unwillingness of professionals to contemplate transracial adoptions that if states are to receive federal funding for adoption, they cannot take ethnicity into account. So plant matching in the USA, in all those states which take federal funding, which I think is all but two of them, ethnicity matching is done blind. Ethnicity cannot be taken into account. That hasn't happened in the UK. Ethnicity is still a factor to be considered, and of course sometimes it might be a very relevant factor, but it is just one factor amongst a host of other factors. The challenge is, Still to change practice. Practice is changing, but again, as Selwyn says here, the practice is still there because uh, social workers' top priorities uh, 
when looking and searching for adopters are first ethnicity and culture. Uh, while uh, she would argue and I would argue more important factors such as warmth, love and commitment uh, are relegated. So there is still uh, a lot to be done about this. But behavior has started to shift. Uh, and although we can't be proud that it still takes 740 days for a, a black child entering care to be placed with his or her permanent adopters, uh, it's a big improvement from 1166 days, which is a figure we had just a few years ago. But it's uh, a subject which has continued to cause uh, real passion. And I've uh, had some difficulty with, it, with adoption panels, with the late panels I spoke about, who again, with the best of in the world, have been unwilling to countenance uh, transracial adoptions and changing practice has been very difficult. But the evidence is incontrovertible. Uh, let me move on to contact. Um, certainly in the 70s and 80s, the consensus in uh, England and in the wider UK was that the key to discharging children from local authority care and to return to their parents was to make sure that contact was a part of being of, of being in care. And the most significant piece of legislation in the UK for a few decades is the 1989 Children's Act, and that included a clear presumption of contact between for, for children when taken into care. Um, and that meant that when a child was in care, this is post-1989, whether with the birth parents agreement or under a care order, the local authority had a duty to endeavour to promote contact between the child and his or her family. Uh, after a child placed with adopters, uh, contact had to be considered by the court. Uh, after adoption, even in 1989, um, the court uh, could consider whether to issue an adoption order, but contact, direct contact, after uh, the adoption order was rare. But the emphasis on contact before adoption and the emphasis on contact while a child is in care has had significant effect on the fact that our countries have a different approach, I think, to closed and open adoption. Uh, because the rationale for contact with children in care was not only that it was key to the child returning home, um, that there were issues of identity if the child didn't uh, have contact. Uh, and uh, I stress, contact is undoubtedly right for some children and may be right for more adopted children than currently enjoy it in the UK. But some of the UK evidence has suggested that the presumption in favour of adoption in England has been misplaced. Here's uh, three studies, McCaskill in 2002, 106 children in contact, and uh, although contact was found to have uh, a positive and negative effect in most cases, and a positive impact alone in 12 current cases, twice the proportion of cases, uh, it had a negative effect on uh, the children. Uh, Professor Selman in 2004 more uh, substantially found that contact was not always positive, 21% of children in her study were physically or sexually abused during unsupervised contact with birth parents. Uh, and this is from uh, Lorne Luxterkamp, a psychologist and expert on adoption. Uh, and I won't read it all, but as you can see, she challenges the very arguments around uh, the presumption in favor of contact. Many adopted and foster children who have suffered maltreatment at the hands of their birth parents continue to have regular face-to-face -face meetings with them this is my emphasis, as well as routine communication in the forms of cards or letters. But the predicament emerging is that from, from such cases of early maltreatment is a contact, the very thing that is meant to provide a remedy for harm can itself be harmful and the likely cause of enduring emotional and psychological damage. Uh, and there has been particular uh, concern in England about contact for infants who are in care where uh, prior to the government legislating to remove the presumption in favor of contact, where it was entirely typical for a child, an infant in care, to have daily contact with the birth parents. And uh, 
almost all practitioners involved in this, even if supporters more generally of contact, uh, thought this was uh, frequently damaging. And uh, researchers, uh, particularly from foster care is involved, has demonstrated significant levels of short-term dis distress before, during, and following contact. Uh, <coughs> A significant period needed for children to settle, which was impossible when contact was every day. So, in short, the government has changed the legal presumption in favour of contact. Children in care now uh, are much less likely to have contact with birth parents if they have been uh, neglected or abused in the parental home. And direct contact with birth parents remains uh, extremely rare. Uh, letterbox contact uh, continues in most adoptions. And finally, uh, siblings. Now, I think when I got involved with this, my assumption was that uh, we would keep siblings together for adoption. Uh, I've got lots of siblings, I've got eight siblings, and sibling relationships I know are very important. And I think the approach to keeping siblings together is uh, captured very much by uh, this quote from 1992 from a, a British institution. Again, I won't read it all, but as you can see, it makes a passionate defense of the need to maintain the bond between brothers and sisters, uh, and argues that where children have already had to cope with separation and loss of their parents, that uh, separating them additionally from their siblings means that they experience the grieving process all over again. And certainly in 2010, when I started to get involved with this, and until once again, I started to read some of the evidence, I think the approach of almost every local authority who made the uh, final decisions on uh, sibling adoption was that siblings should be kept together, despite the fact that that meant that almost invariably, siblings waited much longer for adoption and some sibling groups uh, meant uh, uh, grew old in adoption and uh, younger children uh, uh, were particularly disadvantaged if they were part of a sibling group which involved older brothers and sisters. <coughs> uh, and the reality is the research tells us this. This is a summary of the research uh, published by the British Association for Adoption and Fostering in 2010. Uh, and there are circumstances where the separation of siblings may be in their interests. And again, I won't read them all, but where there's intense rivalry and jealousy, where there's been exploitation of one child uh, from another, uh, where there's highly sexualized behavior between children, uh, and where children have grown up in shared neglect and are uh, uh, born, uh, uh, may present as being very, very close, but they're, they're close because of the trauma that they have um, experienced. But even if those factors, those factors, uh, I think, were uh, have been in practice terms routinely ignored in England until very recently, despite the fact that there's been such uh, a significant shortage of doc doctors. I haven't looked at these figures for some time, but when I first uh, raised the issue of siblings and launched a consultation with professionals in England about the adoption of siblings. Uh, I found that there were more than a thousand children in England in sibling groups of three or more waiting for adoption, a thousand children. Meanwhile, we had registered and approved three sets of adopters who were willing to take a sibling group of three or more. Uh, and slowly, some of that practice has been changed, and where it is considered an in interest of the individual child, uh, then sibling separation is by no means the norm, and nor should it be. But there is a greater instance now of siblings being separated. And it does not, of course, mean the end of the sibling relationships. Uh, although there's very limited contact with birth parents in adoption, it is entirely routine for siblings to see one another and to be in direct contact when adopted by different parents. And uh, healthy relationships between siblings can be maintained. A very good organization in the UK called uh, Family Futures, who do a great deal of post-adoption support. They specialize in therapy for traumatized children and for adoptions, which where uh, there's a struggle. Uh, in uh, the consultation, which uh, I launched on behalf of ministers on siblings, 
uh, this is what this said to me. They asked whether it was possible for foster carers or adoptive parents to deliver the intensity and quality of reparenting that individual children need when sometimes uh, they're trying to do that with two or more children at one time. And their view is that when children have been significantly neglected, where they've suffered ex experienced harm, there are very few adopters who can cope with uh, the compensatory parent that, that is needed if they're doing it for more than one child at a time. And finally, this is a quote of a mother who wrote to me, and I've got her permission, obviously anonymous, to represent it. Uh, this was one of the most moving things I, I've had from anybody in all the time I've been involved. This was someone who adopted uh, two boys and uh, has successfully adopted them. They're now, uh, they're now adults. Uh, and she stayed with them and uh, made the adoption as best as success. But in urging me to consider the need to separate his siblings, this is what she put. I love them very much indeed and will do everything I can for them. But the one, one thing I really wanted to tell you is this. If I could make one change to everything that has happened, I would have separated my two boys. Um, I think this is one area where uh, there's much more progress to be made. It is charged with even greater emotion than the issue of ethnicity. Our intuitive feelings are that siblings shouldn't be separated again. Late panels have been loath to separate siblings from adoptions. But the consequences for that are that, generally speaking, we're letting younger children suffer. Younger children who are eminently adoptable are not getting adoption. No matter how much we've helped adoption agencies, local authorities and voluntary adoption agencies to try to recruit adopters willing to take on sibling groups, mm -hmm. actually the number of adopters who are willing to do so are very, very few. And as I've tried to demonstrate, some experts believe that actually parenting, certainly more than two traumatised and neglected children at one time is pretty much impossible. Practice is slowly changing. and. Uh, the number of siblings who are separated is beginning to grow, and therefore the number of, the number of siblings who are waiting in care for adoption has started to reduce. And it was best characterized for me by uh, a woman who heads an adoption agency called Coram, who feels passionately about wherever possible maintaining sibling relationships, but has argued very simply that actually children need parents first and siblings second. And sometimes practice has relegated uh, the sibling bond to a point where children fail to get the parents the stability that they need. And that finally is it.